The scripture passage today comes from the revelation given to John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 8. Now, before we read this, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Good and gracious Father, Lord, uh, we have fallen by sin and misery, and in that sin, Lord, there is ignorance upon our mind and darkness cast upon our minds. Lord, we have been given this by you, Lord, your word, your divine word spoken, that we would know what is good, what is true, and what is right. And today, as we read, Father, we learn what our future is to be. We learn, Lord, the destiny that you have set out for us. Lord, we can understand none of these things unless your Holy Spirit would teach us as well. The same Spirit that illumined these words would illumine our hearts and minds. And so we pray, Father, that you would breathe that Spirit upon us now, Lord. Upon these hearts, upon these minds that seek you, that we may read, that we may hear, and that we may understand. Lord, bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this is the revelation given to John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 8. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every, away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are a culture that has a lot of stories. In fact, we, we, we tell a lot of stories. You could even say that we are bombarded with stories. We're, we're, we're surrounded by stories. I mean, we've got our, our TVs. We've got movies. We've got books. We've even got songs that tell stories. We've got uh, sometimes even commercials will tell a little story in there. And, and we've got just access to stories all the time. And, and, and we take full advantage of that access. From our TVs and computers and phones. I mean, sometimes we'll sit down and binge stories for hours on end. And sit on the couch for so long that it molds itself like to the shape of our body. I mean, we love our stories. And, and we spend so much time with stories. And it's kind of ironic, as much time as we spend with stories, that we have underestimated how powerful stories really are. And maybe it's because we have so much of them that we've forgotten what a truly powerful thing that stories are. I mean, for us, they're, they're entertainment. Right? We just do it. It's, it's a moment's distraction, something to kind of just kind of help us shed the worries of the day and forget about that, and just kind of get lost in something fun for a while. And I mean, I'm all about that. I'm 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 a big fan of escapism. Believe me. But stories are so much more than that. Stories are, in fact, very powerful. 
You can even make an argument that stories are some of the most powerful things that we possess in our society. Uh, the, the Greek philosopher Plato once said that those who tell stories rule society. Think about that. Those who tell stories rule society. Now, if you don't believe me, we have got a big fight in our country today over stories. We've got a big one about stories. It is blowing up in our schools right now. There's a big fight right now and a conflict over the story of America, of the story that we tell about our nation. You know, on one side you have the story of America that was founded in liberty, it was founded in freedom, and the whole point that we put this whole nation together was people wanting to pursue their rights. And that we exist in order to ensure the rights of the people also exist. And yes, it's not been perfect, but through the struggle, you see the rights and liberty conquer again and again and again in America, becoming a better place. On the other side, you have a story that says America was founded in oppression. It was founded in oppression. It, was, it exists for the purpose of the powerful for the, and the rich, for them to get more powerful and for them to get more rich. And they build this power and wealth off the backs of the oppressed. And the story you believe changes everything you think about this country. Because if this country was founded in liberty and was founded in good principles like freedom and justice, then the institutions of our country need to be preserved because they're good ones. But if we believe that our country was founded in oppression and tyranny, then the institutions of our country need to be broken down and rebuilt. You see what I mean? This is not just about fighting over who learns what history and who teaches what. This is a fight this, over the, the, the soul of our nation, and it's really a fight over stories. See, stories are a big deal. Stories may be the biggest deal out there because the story that you tell yourself the story that you say is true, that determines what you believe. And what you believe determines how you act, how you think, how you view the world, how you view the self, how you view your neighbor, how you see your role and your place in the world. In fact, we could probably say that your story is your religion. And in fact, our religion consists of a lot of stories. You could say it is a story, a story of God. The story of creation, the story of humanity. And in that story, we connect to it, the story of our family and, well, the story of us. Well, that's why this book that I read you today is so important. Not just the Bible, but Revelation. The very last story in the Bible. Because this is the story of the church. And being the story of the church, it is also your story. And it is my story. It's the story of every believer. This is the story of God acting throughout human history. It's the story of God bringing every promise that he's ever made to us to fulfillment. It's a critical story. You could say it's the most important story ever told because it is the story of our future. See, the story you believe makes all the difference about who you are and how you live your life and your attitude towards life. There's a, a popular story that circulates in our world today, and it's not the story in the Bible, unfortunately. It's, it's a secular story. It's the story that we talk about in public. It's the story we accept in our, in our courts and in our, um, in our Congress, in our halls of government. It's the story that we teach our children. And it's a story that says that the universe began for, well, no particular reason, but it just began. It was a purely natural phenomenon. It was kind of an accident. And there was just a big explosion billions and billions of years ago. And with that big explosion, there were lots of fortunate accidents, one after another. And all these fortunate accidents just happened to create a sun. And, and this sun just happened to create a planet just the right distance away for life to evolve one day. 
And in the story, out of, a, out of a primordial soup of a bunch of chemicals just kind of swimming around, for no particular reason, life popped up and emerged. And then once life emerged, it started competing with one another. It started fighting with one another. It was nature red and tooth and claw. And, and, and through this competition, other beings started to come forth. And eventually, that's, well, that's where we came from. No reason. We just got here. And, and how we became human beings like we are today, well, we were just better than the others. We outcompeted them. We outfought them. We outwarred them. But this story is not just a story of the past. There's also a story of the future here. And this is the one that the secular story, that they don't want to tell this part of the story because, well, I'll tell you the story and you'll see why. What's the future of our universe? Everything dies. That's it. That's the future. We're just organisms and we'll die, we'll go into the ground and we'll be forgotten and everything about us will be forgotten and life will just move on. Eventually the earth will die, we'll wear out all the resources. Eventually the sun will die and when the sun dies the earth will be nothing more at that point. And this universe that's growing and expanding will one day stop expanding and its own gravity and energy will start pulling it back in on itself and it will end just as it began, as a small singularity floating in the darkness, the cold, and the void of space. It begins, or it ends rather, just like it began, oblivion. And so what's our story in this story? Starts by an accident, ends in oblivion. You arose by accident as well. And what are you here to do? You're nothing more than a vehicle for carrying your genes to the next generation. You survive, you eat, you mate, and you die. There's really no meaning. There's no purpose. The only thing you can do in this life is enjoy as much as possible, squeeze as much pleasure like you're trying to squeeze the last drop of water out of a dry sponge. Because one day we will all die and be cast into oblivion. And everything that we do will be destroyed and forgotten. That's the story we tell. The story of a world and life that begins in meaningless and ends in despair. And once you understand this, it's really easy to see why there's so much confusion and anxiety in our culture today. Because this is the story we tell. There's no identity. There's no purpose. There's no hope. This is where the church comes in. This is why the church is so important. We carry into the world a very important story, a story that is so important. Jesus said that we are the light of the world, a world in darkness. We carry the story of a universe that is created by a good and loving God, a, a, a world that was created with purpose, a life fashioned by God, life in a world that is made good. Each and every one of us are part of God's plan. Each and every one of us, though, though we are half animal, made from the earth, the dust of the earth, we are also half divine. We bear the God spark in us, the very image of our Lord. We're not just animals. We're more than animals. We're not just carriers of DNA into the future. Life is more than happiness and pleasure. Life has purpose. What purpose, you might ask, what purpose does this life have? Well, that's where we come to Revelation. Where we come to hear the story of where all this is going. The great project of life that God has begun in the universe. That's why it's so important to know this book. To read this book regularly, to make it a part of your life, to know it from one end to the other, because this is a part of your story as well. And unless you know it, you don't know where you fit in to God's great story. The most important part of this story is the end. The part that I read to you today. This is the destiny of the world. This is your destiny. See, throughout Revelation, we've heard the story of the church, the story of the church as it works through history, of God's people, all believers in Christ Jesus in constant conflict with the world that hates God, 
with a world that despises its creator and kings, a world that preaches to us a very different story than what really happened. And in this story, we see God guiding history to its appointed end. And those that do not believe in God, they, they, they resist that history. They want to build their own world. They want to make their own destiny. They want to live their own way. Because they've forgotten that they're not God. And yes, we've been given this world. Yes, we are stewards of this world. But this isn't ours. And one day, we're going to have to give it back. It's a story of a world in rebellion against her rightful king. And this rebellion starts to look successful. It looks like that they've won. And those who are believing in God and trusting in in their rightful king, they seem to be the losers. And and those that have preached this other story, they've seemed to win. But the king returns. The king always returns. And in the story we find that those that were loyal to her Lord and her God will find ultimate fulfillment. And all those who insisted on rebellion will be destroyed. This is the story of a king returning in glory. This is the story of a king who will set up a reign that will last for a thousand years. And at the end of that reign, there will be a last battle. At this last battle, evil will be defeated once and for all. And once evil is defeated, there is a new world that is made, a new heaven, a new earth. And in this world, there is no more sin. In this world, there is no more evil. In this world, there is no more death. There is no suffering. There is no pain. There is no misery. There is no despair. Because in this end, the world is no longer fallen. All things have been completed according to the will of God. That's our destiny. That's our story, a new heaven, a new earth, our life in the paradise with God and living with him forever. So I don't know about you, but for me, that's a story that gives hope. That's a story that gives meaning. Suffering and pain don't get the last word. And so many times in our life, it seems like suffering and pain get the last word for us and for some of the people we love. But this story tells us they don't get the last word. Evil does not win. Hate does not win. Death does not win. Good triumphs. Love conquers. Life is victorious. The best part of it all is that is your story. And that is my story. See, unlike the the story of the world, the story of our of our culture where we all die, we all forget forgotten, and everything is pointless because, well, it dies too. In this story we live. In this story, we live and we are remembered by God, and our work has meaning as well as our life. And the reason I know that our work has meaning is because our work is going to last. Our work is going to endure. And the reason our work will endure is because it has an eternal impact. The work of the world is going to pass away. Everything that is done in evil Everything is done in greed and in sin and in selfishness is one day going to crumble and it's going to pass away and it's going to be no more. But all the work that we do in the Lord, all the work that we do in righteousness and goodness, out of love, out of peace, out of charity, out of hope, those kinds of works will never pass away. In fact, all those works that we do in the Lord are the ways that we build eternity. These are the ways that we bring about the coming of the kingdom of God. These are ways that we actually partner with God in building a new heaven and a new earth. But every act of charity that you do, every act of charity, that's a work that's going to last forever. Every time you forgive one another, you are building eternity. Every time you struggle with your faith, every time you share your faith, You're engaging in a work that builds eternity. 
When you go to Costa Rica to paint a church, you're not just painting a church in Costa Rica. You are actually building temples of eternity. When you're buying food for a needy family in Gilbert, you're not just providing a meal for somebody in need. You're engaging in a work that is going to last forever. When you help a stranded stranger on the road, when you teach a Sunday school class, when you usher at church, when you come and arrange the chairs in the sanctuary, when you give your tithes, when you resist temptation, when you confess your sins and repent and keep your faith in God, in all these things, in the practice of our faith, we are building temples of eternity. We are engaging in a work that is going to last forever. You know, the story about the return of Christ, the story of the last battle and the creation of a new heaven and earth, this, this is the story of God doing work, and God rightfully is, is center stage in all this. You've only got really three main actors, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The, the rest of us, well, we're just featured extras in this story. But we are actors. We're minor, but we are actors. See, sometimes we read this and we're made to think that maybe we're, we're passive in this story. We just kind of sit around, you know. We're enduring. We're in staying faithful. We're kind of getting knocked around by the world and thrown into prison by the Antichrist. But we're just kind of twiddling our thumbs, waiting for Jesus, waiting for it to turn better. There's nothing passive about remaining faithful. If you try to remain faithful, you'll know it takes a lot of work. And if we're faithful, then your faith becomes your work. Your faith directs your work. Your story moves your life. This is the story of us waiting for Christ to return. But this is also the story of us preparing for Christ to return. Preparing our lives, preparing our homes, preparing our church, getting ready for the king to come home. This is the story of us believing in Christ, hoping in Christ, anticipating the return of our king. It's also acting as if every single bit of this is 100% true. See, when you believe the story, when you accept it as your story, then you join the great work of God. Then you connect your story to his story, or rather, he connects his story to yours. And this is the story of our God, of which all of you are critical parts. Now, how do I know that you are a critical part in God's story? Because you're here. Remember, this is not the story of accidents. Our God is not the God who things just happen outside of his control for no reason of all. This is the story of a deliberate God who acts with deliberate purpose and deliberate intention. If you are here in this time, in this place, with this people, at this moment, and not just here in this church right now, although I do mean that, but this moment in history where we exist right now in this place, if you are here, that means God has meant for you to be here. It means He has a place for you in His story. He has a work for you in His great work. Our God is building a reign, a kingdom that will last for a thousand years. And after that, he is building a new heaven and earth, an earth that will endure forever. It's amazing to think that you and I can be part of that work. It's amazing to think that you and I are partnering with God in this great work. It's humbling to know that the, these hands, these hands that can, that, that can hardly build a sandwich, can build eternity. Think about it. These mortal hands can build eternity. 
It's an amazing story. It's an amazing story indeed. Some would say it is too amazing. Some would say the story is too amazing to believe. But what I would say is an amazing story. It's the only kind worth believing. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.